At this time, I want to begin by talking to you about an organization that has one of the most recognizable slogans in advertising history. It's an organization that started in 1944 on April the 25th with the president of the Tuskegee Institute at that time and Mary um, uh, Bethune, who was an administrator to the Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt administration. The purpose of this organization was to provide a funding stream for the 27 historically black colleges, predominantly there in the South. They needed funds to continue to operate and to allow students to come in. Early supporters of this organization included Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself, um, um, John D. Rockefeller Jr., and even JFK. They were early supporters of this organization. And today, the United Negro College Fund has helped more than a half a million students, 500,000 to earn college degrees since its founding. Today, it is the largest private scholarship provider for scholarships for minorities in the United States. Although it was originally designed for African Americans, uh, they support Native Americans, Latinx, and even Asian students in providing funding for them to attend our colleges. The UNCF now provides $100 million in scholarships on an annual basis to students who are attending 1,100 schools across the United States, including 37 of our HBCs, historically black colleges and universities. Their slogan, as you may have guessed, which has become one of the most well-known and recognizable in marketing history, marketing history is a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And what they want you to know is that the investment is in the mind. Black and brown and yellow and red, those who are going to continue their education, they have a mind that would be a terrible thing to waste. And so that has been their slogan uh, since the 70s. And today, um, as I'm preaching my last sermon for 2020, and I turn it over to Elder Cotton, I wanted to reflect on this year and to drive home the point that I believe that God, God is trying to teach us. A lesson that I believe it's paramount that we learn before we even go in to 21. So the sermon title that I am using, the sermon title that I'm going to be using today is A Pandemic is a Terrible Thing to Waste. A Pandemic is a Terrible Thing to Waste. Our journey is going to begin in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians, we're going to the ancient city of Ephesus uh, back in the first century when Paul first arrived there. Ephesus during this time is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. This is a city, folks, that um, had uh, 250,000 residents during the time of Paul. They had an amphitheater that held 25,000 people. And Ephesus was recognized as a city that housed one of the ancient wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis. This letter to the Ephesians that Paul writes could be divided easily into three sections, sit, walk, and stand. Paul, as he reminds the Ephesians that they are already seated in heavenly places. He wants them to understand their position in Christ based on their relationship with Christ and what Christ 
has already done for them. They are already right now seated in heavenly places. And because they're seated in heavenly places, Paul now admonishes them to walk like they know who and whose they are. They are children of the light. They are children of God. And so they should walk, they should live, they should comport themselves as who they belong to. When I was growing up in Chicago, we had a saying, you are a smith, and a smith doesn't act the way everybody else does. A smith acts this way, and a smith acts that way. Well, we are children of God. We have his name, and so we should live and comport ourselves as that. And then lastly, he would tell them, he commands them to stand. They are to stand against the wiles of the devil. They are to stand against evil. They are to stand with the whole armor of God so that they will be able to stand. And so we begin our story there in Ephesians found in chapter five that was read for us verses one through four by our first elder, Will Miles. And I wanna go there, I'm reading this morning from the new King James version of the Bible. And this is what it records. Therefore, be imitators of God, imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, and offering a sacrifice to God for a sweet aroma. This is what Paul is calling for those in Ephesus. You have to understand now, this city of Ephesus was a hot mess. When Paul gets there, there are believers there, and you can find the story in Acts chapter 19. When he arrives there, he meets some disciples of, of, of that are there, and he says, hey, did you receive the Holy Ghost? And they said, what? We haven't even heard there was a Holy Ghost. And they said, well, what, what did you, what were you baptized in? He said, well, we were baptized in the baptism of John. And so Paul breaks it down. John was teaching baptism for the repentance so he could prepare the way for the Lord. And so he expounded on them about Jesus, the resurrected Lord and Savior. And when Paul laid hands on him, Holy Ghost power came down. The Bible declares they spoke in tongues and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. But not only that, when he gets there, he, uh, he's there reasoning with them, but Paul is messing up the money because he stayed in Ephesus two years teaching about Jesus Christ to the point where business began to go down. So you'd have to know. Demetrius is a, a person that's in charge of this organization that they are making little um, silver and clay replicas of the temple of Artemis. They are making bank on this. And Paul is messing them up because Paul says, ain't no God that you can make with your hand. Ain't no God in that temple. And so business is going down and they get so angry they drive him out of Ephesus. They got the amphitheater field. They're screaming, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so it's creating the problem and havoc. And so there have to be, they, Paul is driven out, but there are still believers that are there in that city. People are so much into witchcraft that they have to bring their stuff as they're convicted as disciples of Christ and they throw down all of the stuff that they were practicing, the witchcraft and magic and all of that. Paul is calling for the Ephesians that are staying behind as he has to leave. He's calling them to be reminded that you are children of God. You need to be in imitators of God. You need to be like God. If people can't see Jesus, Lord have mercy, they should be able to see him in you. And in order to be imitators of God, you have to walk in love. You have to live a life of love that reflects the love that God has so graciously given to you. And that love needs to be reflected to those around you. Too many of us walk in hate, even in the church. We've seen it in our country. God in 2020 has exposed the fault line of racism and partisanship. He's exposed the hidden Hatred that is right under the surface where I don't care what happens to you, it's all about me. I'm not going to wear a mask. If you get sick, that's on you. We see that now. God has exposed it in 2020. And for the believers, 
who are so uh, supposed to be walking with God, their masks uh, have been removed. They have been exposed, and we see them for who they are, sh wolves in sheep clothing. As we skip down to verses 8 through 10, here is what now Paul transitions to as he speaks to the believers in Ephesus. He says, for you were once darkness, but you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. He's still using this euphemism of walking and living, but now in the light of the Lord. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Because God has delivered us from darkness. Now, I know for some of you, it's been so long, you forgot. You thought you woke up in the morning saved. You thought you were born saved, but you weren't saved all of your life. So God's going to have to bring it back to your remembering. He's going to have to remove your spiritual amnesia so that you can remember that you were in darkness. And then God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so now you are children of the light based on the mercy of God, based on the grace of God, based on the sacrifice of God in his son, Jesus Christ. And so now you are to walk in that light, to live in that light, and not only just walk and live in it, but you have to be able to discern what is acceptable to the Lord. Because he says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. See, this implies that you are called to be, as a believer, as a Christian, a critical thinker. See, we reject blind faith. Our faith is not blind. Our faith is rooted in Scripture, and Scripture reveals a resurrected and crucified Lord, Jesus Christ. So our faith is not blind. We speak those things that are not as though they already are, but is based and rooted in what God has revealed in the word of God. So our faith is not blind. So even the Bible says, think on these things. That's what the word of God declares. We're called to be critical thinkers. We're called to be lifelong learners, knowing and learning what is pleasing to the Lord. That's why we have to spend every day in the word of God. That's why we never graduate from the word of God. And I just want to take this time to pause to congratulate two of our newest graduates here at the Tucson Sharon Church, Enid, uh, Enid, Enid um, McTaggart. She graduated with her nursing degree from Brookline College. And then we want to recognize Alyssa Earl, who graduated with her bachelor's in public health yesterday from the University of Arizona. We commit in them and great things that God has done for them. We are called to be lifelong learners. You don't graduate from scripture. You don't graduate from the word of God. You are going to be a constant learner. And so that's what we're called to do because we need to learn what is pleasing unto the Lord. And so now, as we move to the crux of this message today, we move now to Ephesians. Chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. So now Paul says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. See, see, now Paul is saying circumspectly. That means you need to be careful. You need to be mindful for how you conduct and comport yourself. Because this is what I've learned. Someone is always watching. Someone is always watching us. I've been amazed that well, my four years at Oakwood University, when I was there, you know, finding people later on as I was going into ministry who knew me when I was a student, but I didn't know them. And they would say, oh, yeah, I remember you at Oakwood. And I'm like, um, I don't remember. Oh, yeah, I used to see you going around the campus. I used to watch you. And, and letting us know what Paul has already said. We're living epistles read by all people. You know they're watching you in your neighborhood. You may not notice it, but they're, they're watching you. They're watching you on your job. They, they're watching you. They watch you at school. 
They're watching you. People are always watching you. And guess what? They have the right, especially when you name Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they have a right to inspect your confession. Does your confession line up with the way you live, the way you walk? So Paul says you got to walk circumspectly. See, Paul is talking to people in a very significant part of the Roman Empire. Your Ephesus was located in modern day Turkey, but it is one of the three most important cities in the entire Roman Empire. It's a rich city, commerce. When, when the temple of Artemis was destroyed, um, about the, at the time that Alexander the Great was born, uh, the, the um, ancient historians say that the reason the temple of Artemis was destroyed was because the gods were distracted because Alexander the Great was born. And so that's why the temple was left unprotected. Well, when it was burned down and destroyed and Alexander heard the story about Wow, the temple was destroyed because of my birth, because the gods were watching all over me. And so Alexander wanted to give a gift to the Ephesians so that they could rebuild the great temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, one of the first buildings constructed completely of marble. When, they, when he sent the when he sent the offer to help rebuild the temple, the folk in, in Ephesus got so much money, so much money, they said, um, we, we, we respectfully decline. Now, I don't know how you decline Alexander the Great, one of the greatest generals and leaders in our time. Well, what they did was they uh, massaged his ego. They said, well, you know what? We cannot take your gift because it would be inappropriate for one God to build a temple to another God. And so by the stroke of his ego, they said, we got this, Alexander, and they rebuilt the temple themselves. That became one of the seventh wonders of the ancient world. Paul is telling these folk in this city that's prominent, that's rich, watch how you live. Live circumspectly. Be careful about how you live and do not comport yourself and act like fools, but be wise. Folks, I, I am dumbfounded when I look at America, the greatest nation on God's green earth, the wealthiest nation on God's green earth, the most advanced nation on God's green earth. And yet, we are totally unwilling to do the simple things to bring this virus under control. As a matter of fact, since the virus first arrived in January, we are doing worse in December after almost a year with all of the advances, with all the technology, with all the money and resources, we are doing worse than any place on earth. And Christian believers are acting like fools. Yeah, I said it. And if you don't invite me back, I'm okay. And uh, calm down, preacher. This is your church. You got to come back. Okay, so now watch this now. Let me tell you something. Christians are bringing a reproach against God by how they are conducting themselves. They're conducting themselves in such a way that their neighbors are disgusted with them. They're looking at churches that have become super spreaders of COVID-19, and they are in the same community with the church, wishing that the church wasn't even in their community. Lord, have mercy on us. Believers, believers, we are bringing a reproach to the name of God by how we behave ourselves. Pastor standing behind the pulpit and being presumptuous saying, God will protect us. Well, yes, God will protect us, but not in presumption. When we presume on God, you know, the devil took Jesus up to the temple, put him up there on the top and said, cast yourself down. And then he used scripture. He will give his angels charge over you. Jesus says, do not tempt the Lord. And when we know 
health professionals, doctors, nurses, tell us simply wear a mask. It will help us slow down the spread. It's not going to cure, it's not going to stop COVID-19, but at least limits the damage that it is doing in our nation. And I'm not talking about people who've never named the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about Christians right now. We have been so disobedient, so self-centered, and so selfish that we've got blood on our hands. Some of us. Some of us have blood on our hands. And let me tell you something. Ezekiel says, judgment, it begins at the house of God. God starting with us. He's starting with us because we have believers who are acting like fools. We are living, supposed to be living a sacrificial life before unbelievers. We are supposed to be doing that, but we are bringing a reproach to the name of God in this country. And Paul not only says that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, but Paul says the reason you need to do this is because redeeming the time. You have to redeem the time because the days ahead are evil. The days are evil ahead. So we got to redeem the time. It means in Greek, you make the most of the opportunity. That's what it means. He's admonishing them to walk wisely and not as fools, to live sacrificial lives in front of the believers. And they are to redeem the time, make use of the time, take opportunity for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our gospel has been Lord, have mercy, castrated by our behavior. Nothing wrong with the gospel. It's the people who are supposed to believe in the gospel that's making the gospel of Jesus Christ impotent right now. And folks, the days ahead, I'm not telling you 2021 20, will be a bed of roses. I'm just praying it is better than 2020. My kids and I were watching a commercial. Uh, these advertisers were really good. Can you imagine the devil? He's having such a rough time. He gets his phone out and he goes to an app because he's looking to find somebody to date. And so he finds someone just has numbers on it. And so they decide to meet up. And so they meet up and, and he's looking at the photo and, and she sees him and they're in the same place. And, and he says, oh, oh, are you 202? She says, oh, just call me 2020. Lord, have mercy. The devil is dating 2020. Have mercy. And so let me tell you something. I'm not guaranteeing 2021 is going to be uh, this place of uh, euphoria, but I'm telling you I'm praying that it's better than 2020. But folks, there are evil days ahead of us even in 2021. So we have to make the most redeeming the time. We can't let this pandemic go to waste because a pandemic is a terrible thing to waste. See, if Paul, if Paul was speaking to us today, see, that's his message to Ephesus. But the word of God is a living, breathing organism because it is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It's breathing, it's living, it speaks to us even today. So what Paul would be saying to us today is he might say to us, live a surrendered life to Jesus publicly so that everybody can see it. Since you're a living epistle read by all men and women anyway, be an imitator of God. Conduct yourself as if you got some sense. Live wisely and not presumptuously before a watching and waiting world. You know, all these folks that don't believe in science, go to the roof of your house and jump off and say, I believe I can fly and just reject gravity. Be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Wear a mask. Socially distance, I know it's difficult. That's why we're putting on a program talking about trauma-informed church, 4.30 Mountain Standard Time. Trauma-informed church because yes, for some the social distancing has been traumatic. It's difficult, but unfortunately it's what we have to do at this time in this season. Wash your hands regularly. And think of others, not only yourselves. And folks, 
I'm telling you, every one of you get to make your own decision. But my recommendation, my suggestion is when you can, some sooner than others, get vaccinated, get, to, get vaccinated. Now, I know there are rumors that have already started that the vaccine, they're going to use the vaccine to track us and trace us. So don't get the vaccines, folks, folks, please. They don't need a vaccine to track you. They track you with these. They know where you're going. Facebook knows where you're going. Amazon knows where you're going. Google knows where you're going. They don't need a vaccine to track you. They can do it right there with your phones. Folks, come on. Think. Then you got those who say, well, uh, the vaccine is going to implant a microchip in you and you'll get the mark of the beast. Now, I am sympathetic to those who don't know any better. Bible even declares, Jesus says in Acts, um, Acts 17, verse 30, uh, the Bible says that in the times of these ignorances, God winks at it. So they're sincere. They're sincerely wrong. But, but they're sincere. So I'm going to give them a pass because they think that if they get the vaccine, there's a microchip and they might get the mark of the beast. I give them, I give them a pass. They're confused about what the mark of the beast is. But shame on Seventh-day Adventists. Shame on us who are deceived on this point. We know exactly what the mark of the beast is, and pardon my English, it ain't no vaccine. It ain't no microchip. We know that is not what the mark of the beast is. For those of you who haven't been there for a while, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, John the Revelator says, then a, a, a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He should be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. So we are not talking about a microchip. We're talking about something in your forehead and in your hand. And in John's day, in your forehead means you actually believe this. You consent to it. And, and, and the four in the, in the hand is a sign of cooperation. I don't believe it, so it's not in my forehead, but I'm going to go along to get along, so I'm going to give you my hand in cooperation. So understand, it's not a microchip implanted in your head or in your hand. The mark of the beast is a decision. The whole theme of the book of Revelation is about worship. And the mark of the beast will distinguish who you worship. This is the last message of warning to the world before the judgment of God. It's a message that will go to the world just before the second coming of Jesus. And those who receive the mark of the beast will be lost. They will not be saved because they have chosen to allow, ally themselves, align themselves and ally themselves with the devil who is behind the whole mark of the beast. He's behind the beast. He's behind those two beasts in Revelation chapter 13. Now, most of you don't believe this. Could you hardly get, you know, what's amazing is we can hardly get some of you to come to church once a week. Some of you, we couldn't get to church more than twice a month. And we can barely get you online. So you don't even have to leave your home. You don't have to get in a car. You don't really even have to dress up and some of you don't. Um, so, so you don't even have to go to the convenience. We bring the church to you. We can't even get some of you online. And Lord have mercy to tell you to hit a share button so you can invite your friends and families, your neighbors, so that they can hear the gospel. We can barely get you to do that. So Please spare me with your righteous indignation about a building being closed. Um, I'm not hearing it because when the building was open, it wasn't full then. And now all of a sudden you're banging down, kicking down the doors. You want to be in. You want to be in the church now because there is a pandemic. See, that's fire escape religion. That's what that is. There's a fire, then you want to run to the church. You know, most of us have been around long enough. I remember what church was like after 9-11. Oh, they were jam-packed. All the churches were jam-packed. You had Muslims, Catholic, Jews, and Christians all coming together into the church because we had an event. 
But that wore off after a while. Just like this. You know, I'm keeping track of all those folk asking about when the church is going to open. Don't think I have forgotten who you are. Because when the church is open, I'll be looking for you every week. I'll be looking for you on Sabbath morning. I'll be looking for you for Sabbath school. I'll be looking for you for Wednesday night prayer meeting. I'll be looking for you on Tuesday for discipleship class and Thursday. And for whatever else we have going on, I'll be looking for you. Since you've been so concerned about the building being closed, we'll be looking for you. And what we will find out is your Bark is a whole lot worse than your bite. That's what we'll find out. Folks, you can't get the mark of the beast accidentally. You can't get the mark of the beast unexpectedly. You are going to have to make a conscious decision, a conscious decision about what you're going to do. God is going to lay it out before the entire world, and you're going to have to make a decision. The mark of the beast is a choice. You will have to reject the clear teachings of Jesus as in the scripture. You will have to reject that in order to believe a lie. Now, uh, one last thing, one last thing for those of you who might be asking the question, what would Ellen White do? Okay. Now, understand, I think that's the wrong question to ask anyway. But I'll go ahead and entertain it because the only thing I'm asking is what will Jesus do? But for those of you who want to know what Ellen White will do, I've got something for you today. You know, I'm, 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 I'm going out. I'm, I'm, I'm going out all guns blazing. I ain't going to have no ammo left. And, and this one is just a throwaway. I'm, I'm throwing this away like, like David threw that stone at Goliath. Just a throwaway on the way out for 2020. This is for all the Adventist conspiracy theorists out there. I got something just for you. Now, watch this now. In, in June 12, on June 12, 1931, a letter was sent to one of Ellen White's secretaries by the name of D.E. Robinson. And they're writing, asking a question about what was Ellen White's attitude about vaccinations. So I'm now quoting him. You asked for definite and concise information regarding what Sister White wrote about vaccination and serum. This question can be answered uh, very briefly. So, so far as we have any record, she did not refer to them in any of her writings. So she didn't write about vaccinations. And so you might say, okay, well then the, the question is open so I, I can decide for myself. Well, you can always decide for, your, for yourself, but let's not leave so quickly. Then he goes on, I'm quoting, you will be interested to know, however, that at a time when there was an epidemic of smallpox in the vicinity, she herself was vaccinated and urged her helpers, those connected with her, to be vaccinated. In taking this step, Sister White recognized the fact that it has been proven that vaccinations either renders one's immune immune from smallpox or greatly lightens its effect if one comes down with it. She also recognized the danger. Oh Lord, hear me, help me Holy Ghost. She also recognized the danger of their exposing others if they fail to take this precaution. It's signed by D.E. Robinson. And for those of you who want the reference, Selected Messages, book two, page 303. Again, I say Selected Messages, book two, page 303, and you will find the same quote and recognize I'm taking nothing out of context. Get vaccinated when it's your turn. Now, before Paul, now because Paul is an evangelist, Paul would tell us today, brothers and sisters, take advantage of this pandemic. Use it to point people to Jesus. They know they can't depend on their jobs. 20 million people lost their jobs during this pandemic. Only half have returned. 
Unemployment is about to run out for many of them. Many of them are under an eviction notice. Every safety net they had has been removed. This is a time when they're willing to think about Jesus. The government has failed them. Their jobs has failed them. Some of their families have failed them. The communities have failed them. Even some of their churches have failed them. So this is a perfect opportunity to point them to Jesus. Paul would say, don't let this pandemic go to waste. Why, Paul? He would say, a pandemic is a terrible thing to waste. You see, the devil overplayed his hand in 2020. See, he knew he could discourage some folk by simply just closing the doors of the church. You'd be totally discombobulated and wouldn't know what to do. Forget what day is even the Sabbath because the church doors are closed. He knew that some of you wouldn't know what to do because you barely go to church once a week. Uh, and so, so he knew he could do a number on some of us and, and oh Lord, what are we gonna do? The church is closed. Uh, uh, he knew this, but let me tell you folks, I mean, you got to get into your word. The Bible declares in John 4, 24, God is spirit. He's not locked and confined in some building. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Folks, you can worship God in your home, and it don't take no praise team for me to worship God all by myself. You can worship God behind your computer screen. You can worship God on your phone. You can worship God under a tree, folk. It's God being worshipped in spirit and truth. That's the requirement for you to have an encounter with God. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. I can get happy all by myself. I don't need a praise team. I don't need a choir. It can just be me and Jesus, and I'll sing off key all day long. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and what he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. See, I don't need a church building. I don't need a choir. I don't need anyone to get me hyped about Jesus and what he has done for me. And so this devil, he overplayed his hand in 2020. He played a strong hand, but he overplayed his hand. See, the devil didn't think that when we closed the building down, we would go on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube and continue to preach the gospel. See, the devil didn't think our attendance would quadruple during this pandemic. No, it didn't dip. It went up. We got people watching us from all around the world. The devil didn't think that in this pandemic that our tithes and offerings would go up and we're about to set another record record in the 75 year history of this church, the largest tithe ever. He didn't think that, you know, and see, let me tell you something commercial for those of you who haven't done what you're supposed to do, square up with God in 2020. Don't let the devil destroy your blessing for 2021. The devil didn't think we would serve more people in the pandemic in our food distribution than we did before. See, the devil didn't think that while the building was closed, that we would renovate the entire church to the glory of God so that when we walk in, we will say, what has God brought? This is the Lord's doing, and it is glorious in our eyes. See, the devil didn't think that we would have a, a America will reject four more years of chaos and confusion and make a change in 2020 so that on January 20th, there's a new president that is being uh, inaugurated. See, the devil didn't think that there would be a vaccine so soon in record time. See, the devil didn't think that what he meant for evil, God would turn it around for good. He overplayed his hand. And Sharon, I'm here to declare, based on the un, uh, the based on the unchanging word of God, trouble won't last always. And that's why in January we hit the reset button. We're gonna break up with 2020. And we're going to start dating 2021. We're going to get an upgrade in 2021. Say amen, single folks. I know y'all been dating socially isolated. But hey, come 2021, you will be able to break up from social distancing. Uh, and we'll be able to actually mingle together. Now, praise God. Some of you, God is saving you because you got yourself in a whole lot of trouble. So God is giving you some time to think and reflect. Help me, Holy Ghost. So now watch this. In 2021, we are committed 
to redeeming the time because the days are evil. And so in 2021, we already have our focus. We have our focus. See, what we're going to do is three things for 2021. I'm going to drop this on you, and then we're going to close out. Three things that we're going to be focusing on for 2021 as we hit the reset button from 2020. First thing is we're going to do is we're going to reclaim. We're going to reclaim those in 2020 who've lost their way. They've been distracted. Um, they've been discouraged. We're going to reclaim that in Jesus' name. We're going to do that in the name of Jesus. So we're going to reclaim folks in 2020. Now, what else we're going to do is we're going to retain what we have. We're going to build up what we have. We're going to encourage you. We're going to build you up. We're going to strengthen you and get you ready to do ministry. Why? Because we need to redeem the time. We redeem the time. Because let me tell you something. God, God is going to, he is going to give us back the time that we lost. Um, he's going to allow us to reclaim the year that the locusts have eaten. So, so we're going to retain and build up what we've retained. And then after we've done that, the third thing we're going to do is we're going to sustain. We're going to sustain the momentum that God has given us. He's got the wind at our back. And as the Holy Ghost moves us, we're going to make further inroads in the community. We're going to take back territory, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, taking back territory from the devil. And we're we're going to stake that claim for Jesus. So the three things that we're going to focus on in 2021, we're going to reclaim, we're going to retain, and then we're going to sustain. That's what we're going to do. We're going to redeem the time. God is going to restore the year of 2020 that the locust is eaten, and we're going to reclaim that in 2021. Why? Because God knows a pandemic is a terrible thing to waste, and we will not allow it to be wasted. So I'm asking for you to partner with me as we prepare for 2021. I'm asking for you to join me as we begin the process of redeeming the time. As we reclaim the year that the locusts eat, I'm asking you to join me as we reclaim, as we retain, and as we sustain what God is doing for us right now, he's going to do it in 2021. Hey, folks, let me tell you something. God is going to renew what he has started already in 2020 for us. He's done some marvelous things for us. We're going to continue that work to his name's glory and honor. And so I'm asking you, church family, join me as we hit that reset button so that we can reclaim, retain, and sustain what God is doing right here at the Tucson Sharing Church. For those of you who are watching from all over, if you've not made your calling and election sure, this is the time to do it. This is the time to do it. Before we even enter the new year, you need to repent. You need to go to God, ask for forgiveness, and renew your covenant. For those of you who've never made a decision for Jesus, I extend an invitation to you right now. I extend an invitation for you to get to know Jesus. And if you say, well, pastor, how do I get to know him? I can send you Bible studies. We can do Bible studies during Zoom. I can give you my email address. You contact me and we'll work out a way that works for you. You don't have to be in Tucson. Because of the beauty of the internet, we'll come to you wherever you are. All you have to do, take down my email, pastorjs1896 at gmail.com. Again, that's Pastor JS1896 at gmail.com. You email me and we will find out how to get you ready for Jesus in 2021. Some of you who want to call, you can call me 520-261-1881. Again, that's 520-261-1881. And you can reach me and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. But we need you to make a decision for Jesus. You see that nothing else can save you. You see there's nothing else that you can depend on. You see that the arm of flesh will fail you. So I give you Jesus. Try Jesus. You tried everything else. Try Jesus. And we'll be happy to lead you into a saving relationship with him. We'll help you study the word of God to know him for yourself. And for those of you who would like to join this end time movement, we're preparing people for the second coming of Jesus. Or we can get you ready to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Lay hands on you so Holy Ghost power will be upon you so God can use you as he prepares 
for his soon return. We thank you for joining us today on our worship experience. And so we just want to offer a word of prayer for you. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we're grateful. We're thankful for everyone that joined us today, Lord God. And we just believe that this was a divine appointment, Lord. You had a message for your people, Lord. And your people are hearing. They have ears to hear. They have hearts to obey what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Oh, God, as we prepare to hit the reset button in January 2021, Lord God, we have committed ourselves at the Tucson Sharing Church. We're going to reclaim what has been lost. We're going to reclaim the year that the locust has eaten. We're going to redeem the time because the days are evil. We're going to retain what we have and build them up, Lord God. And then allow last thing we plan to do in 2020 is sustain the momentum that you have already given to us. And Lord, when it's all said and done, we will simply declare this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. To God be the glory. Great things that you have done. So we thank you. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor for those who are going to respond today. Oh, Lord, seal their decisions right now in their in your courts above. And we thank you for this privilege and opportunity to come together to worship you in spirit and in truth, to worship you today in the beauty of holiness. For we ask it all in the matchless and worthy name of that wonderful child, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us in the Tucson Sharon Worship Experience. Goodbye.